Hello everybody, I'm Dakian. This is my review of Playing at the World. Playing at the World is a book which, as it says on the cover, is a history of simulating wars, people, and fantastic adventures from chess to role-playing games. It's by John Peterson. I don't know much about John Peterson. There's not much of a bio even on his own website, so I'm not sure what his credentials are. Uh, but from reading the book, he's very familiar with historical method and how to write academic text. So he must have some sort of education, I suppose. The book is, um, well, including index, about 700 pages. It can be bought for around $35 from various places, I believe. And it is, well, it has sort of a color cover, it is mostly just plain text inside, a few small illustrations in black and white, some photographs and, and uh, charts, but as you can tell here, it's 99% text. Um, it covers the history, as as the cover might might uh, indicate, of gaming from about the 18th century up until the 1970s. I would say that the main uh, body of the text stops at around 1977, and it only covers events after that in a very uh, sketchy fashion. And the reason is that this is a history of role-playing games that is the pre-history of role-playing games. It's not the history of how role-playing games developed from D&D onwards. It's about what all the predecessors to D&D were, uh, what all the influences were, what the strands of thought were that came together to create something new in the 1970s. And it's a very thorough examination of that. It um, as, as I uh, might have hinted, is kind of academic in its approach, which I like. If you compare it to another book that I reviewed a while back called Of Dice and Men, that book was very journalistic. It was written by a journalist, and it was written in the typical journalist fashion of just grabbing a few people who seem to know something and just asking them whatever. John Peterson does not um, go at it that way. He depends almost entirely on primary source material. He goes to publications and private correspondence and the like, which is contemporary with the events that he is describing. In other words, a proper historical method. The book is organized in five main chapters and an epilogue. Uh, the first chapter is called The Prelude to Adventure, 1964 to 1974, and is, is kind of an introduction showing the immediate prehistory of D&D, how Dave Arneson and Gary Gygax were involved in miniatures wargaming and board gaming, and how that sort of um, led into D&D, partly through their rediscovering of even older war games. Uh, Peterson, as early as this chapter, sort of prefigures that uh, the revelation is going to come that the idea that the players can do anything, that players have a lot of agency, is what separates a role playing game from. The type of gaming that was done at the time, which was mostly Avalon Hill board games and miniature war games, where the rules set very hard limits to what could be done. And Peterson uh, finds the idea of player agency mediated, mediated by an impartial referee in the older military war game simulations, uh, mostly coming out of a German tradition known as Kriegsspiel where where um, the idea that, that the player can try anything they could reasonably try in real life and the judge or referee has to adjudicate and just make a decision. 
and in these early games it was made purely on common sense. Um, anyway, moving on to chapter two, which is um, oh right the the um, the medieval fantasy genre. So this is the um, the other influence on on D and D. Why why is it why is it fantasy especially? Why is it not just uh, historical role playing? Well, he he delves uh, Peterson that is into how fantasy um, as such as modern fantasy literature evolved during the early twentieth century. Uh, there's there's um, he kind of traces how things like the character classes in D&D and how the typical equipment that a pseudo-medieval adventurer has 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 its precedence in, in these books and stories. He also postulates that it's possible that fantasy was the setting for the first role-playing game because um, the United States at the time was, that is the early 70s, was a time of uh, largely anti-war sentiment among uh, the um, the general populace. So, so <clears throat> anything said in modern day war 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 time war gaming in the modern day was not generally very popular. It, this is the reason historical war gaming and fantasy war gaming was popular. He said he claims. Uh, specifically. Gary Gygax, he, he uh, discovers, was in fact a pacifist. You might be surprised to learn that an avid wargamer was a pacifist, but he, he believed that, as many did, that if you sort of get your aggressive impulses out in a game, then you don't need to express them in real life. Uh, it's, it's the idea of gaming as catharsis. Um... Peterson also sees role-playing games as a natural consequence of a, f a very popular sub-genre in, in science fiction and fantasy, which is called the visitation genre, where people from the modern day are transported to a fantasy realm, beginning with the Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's Court and continuing on with lots and lots of other examples. And, in fact, this was the idea behind Arneson's original Blackmore campaign, that the players were playing themselves transported into Blackmore. And, well, themselves, the, these uh, uh, alter egos started to gain abilities, of course, that they themselves didn't have in real life. But anyway, the, the basic idea was that the characters had the same names as the players and acted as the players would act. So they didn't act... At that time, they, they didn't take on any uh, alternate roles yet. <clears throat> In chapter 3, a system, the rules of the game, uh, as I uh, mentioned, they, they, he goes back to um, the very deep history of wargaming, starting in the 1700s, and spends most of it in Germany during the late 1700s and early 1800s and mid-1800s, and uh, goes into a lot of detail about various games that were played in order to sort of um, teach kings and generals about how to wage war. Um, and this, this history is interesting in itself. It's interesting for, for war gamers as well as, as role-playing gamers of course, because it, it leads, of course, also into the kind of games uh, that wargamers play. Uh, he, uh, Peterson compares these older games to the type of systems in Dungeons and & Dragons and, and, and sort of traces where ideas like hit points and armor class and saving throws came from in, in previous games. Chapter 4 is about the role part of the role-playing games and 
immersion, how to take on a different persona, how to play let's pretend. Um, now the term role-playing, interestingly, is much older than D&D, but was not originally applied to D&D. The first edition of D&D, original D&D, does not have the term role-playing on its cover, and it's not mentioned in the rules anywhere. It, it sort of um, gets applied a couple of years later, after the fact, actually. But the term role-playing existed originally as a kind of um, therapy, uh, um, sort of um, psych method used by psychologists to to uh, help people uh, understand different experiences and to sort of build empathy and the like. Uh, Peterson also describes early attempts to sort of play roles in 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 play by mail war games. And he also describes um, role playing used in as a sort of teaching method. Um, I don't know if you have this term in English, but in Sweden we call them forum games, usually today, which is where you sort of set set, set up a, a specific situation, um, sort of kind of work out in advance the th kind of things that could happen in, for example, a classroom or some other situation at work and and sort of take on different roles to to gain different perspectives. Uh, chapter 5 is called The Dawn of Role Playing and covers just a few years actually. It's a, quite a lot of pages for, for you know, covering the the period from the first publication in 1974 of D&D to like the 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 um, kind of late 77 early 78 um, it describes how D&D uh, created a new market you might just, might say for a new kind of game um, and also how how the basic um, components of a role-playing game eventually became understood, identified, and uh, applied to different contexts, contexts, uh, so, so that other games could sort of take market share. Um, it's, of course, started out with just trying to copy D&D by doing another fantasy game, but eventually developed into other genres of gaming. And, and, and also, it's kind of discovered how how the the basic components of of what uh, Peterson calls um, the modes of exploration, combat, and logistics could be sort of divvied up, divvied up and and um, emphasized in different ways, and you could find different rules for these different parts of it. Finally, the epilogue has. A little, little bit about the the sort of moral panic of the 1980s, where where um, uh, role playing was seen as devil worship by some, and um, you know uh, the the um, the weird uh, accusations such as the ones made in Mazes and Monsters, and the organization bothered about D and D. But most of, of the epilogue is actually about more positive influences, uh, specifically how, how the ideas of role-playing games, and d, d in particular, have uh, led to modern computer gaming. Um, he shows how, how the modern computer game industry could not have existed without D&D, because there are so many concepts that are taken directly from there. And, yeah, so we reached the end of the book. So in conclusion, uh, this is a, I, I, I like this book a lot. It's a very good book at, it, it does exactly what it sets out to do, but you have to be clear before you get it about what exactly that is. And I, hopefully this overview I've given you explains a little bit about what it, the book talks about and, and you can understand if you're interested in that or not. Um, it is not 
a book that is interested in sensationalism. It passes over uh, some of the more hotly debated topics about D&D's history. Only like, for example, the, the uh, Gygax versus Arneson thing, that whole uh, rigmarole, that, that's only touched upon as much as actual primary sources will allow. None of the speculation, none of the second-hand information that so, so often makes the rounds, none of what, even what the principal uh, actors involved have said after the fact is considered relevant. Again, good, solid historical um, research. And I appreciate that a lot. So, if you want sensationalism, look elsewhere. If you want something very... Um, um, how should I put it? Authoritative. Something that sticks to just the facts, ma'am. This is a book for you. And with that, I will say just that I'm Doc Yacht. And until next time I see you, I'm signing off.